It's no secret that local journalism has struggled since the Great Recession, with hundreds of newspapers shuttering and thousands of reporters losing their jobs. Over the past few years, entrepreneurs have launched dozens of local news startups to help fill in the gap, but there's still an ongoing debate as to whether local news should be a for-profit or non-profit industry. Berkeley Side is one of the few organizations that has tried both models. For the first several years of its existence, it was a for-profit entity, but then in 2019, its founders switched it over to a non-profit model, and it's since expanded into three separate verticals that cover the Bay Area, with a fourth launch planned for 2024. In an interview, co-founder Lance Noble walked me through how Berkeley Side came to be, why it switched to a nonprofit model, and how it generates revenue through a combination of grants, memberships, sponsorships, and large donations. Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and this is The Business of Content, the show about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. If you want to listen to an audio version of this show, subscribe to The Business of Content wherever you get your podcasts. And longtime listeners of this show know that it carries no advertising. The only way to support the painstaking work I do here is by becoming a paid subscriber to my newsletter. Subscribers get a half-hour introductory phone call with me. They also get to submit questions every month that I try my best to answer on this very show. Subscribe at simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, on to my interview with Lance. Hey, Lance, thanks for joining us. Really happy to be here. So we're here to talk about this tremendously successful local news outlet that you co-founded. Um, but before that, let's just talk a little bit about your background in journalism. Like you started out in business journalism. Like, you know, I think you were even uh, reporting for like the World Economics Forum. So you were writing so for like, you know, rich global elites, right? Absolutely. Uh, trilateral commission, you know, conspiracies, all that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, my background was in business journalism, largely. I started writing about architecture and design um, and then took a turn into writing more general business um, journalism. I was editor of a, a large business magazine in London called Management Today. Um, and I was recruited from that. I was headhunted from that to... Um, run the magazine of the World Economic Forum, uh, the Geneva-based organization that's most famous for its Davos annual meeting, um, which is at the heart of a lot of conspiracy theories, um, which to my knowledge are largely untrue, um, but I was definitely in the belly of the beast as far as some people are concerned. Yeah, Um, and and to be part of the World Economic Forum, to be a member, it's like, it costs like $200,000 a year just to start out, right? Or something absurdly high like that, right? Yeah, corporations are members. So, you know, it's it's not hurting their bottom line very much. Um, Yeah, but sort of many of the world's largest corporations and banks and and things like that are members of the world. Yeah, and it's like an invite-only forum as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're, you have this, you, you were reporting, I think you worked there in the 90s. Um, how did you, how long have you lived in Berkeley, California? Um, 18 years now. Okay. So, so post two, post millennium, post 2000. Um, why did you, why did you move to Berkeley? Um, my wife and I, I'd, I'd lived in London for a very long time. As you can tell from my accent, I am American, but um had lived there a long time. We were ready for a change. Um, and one of my sisters has long lived in Berkeley. We were familiar with the Bay Area, as many people who visit the Bay Area feel. If you can find a way to live here, it seems like a good idea. Um, and actually, a couple of my Davos connections were had a startup idea, and they wanted me involved. And so that gave us an excuse to, to move here. So you were working for some kind of like startup of some sort there? Yeah, a sort of consulting idea that in the way of most startups started up and then didn't work. Um, so, but it got it got us out here. And what was kind of the state of local news? Like, obviously, in the Bay Area, there's the San Francisco Chronicle, right? Was that mm-hmm. like the only major local newspaper? Yeah, in the early so we moved here in 2005 the chronicle obviously was around still is around Um, there was also the oakland tribune um um, for people in the east bay 
I don't know that it was running equal with the Chronicle for local news, but it but it was pretty good. I mean, certainly the Oakland Tribune back then had a full time reporter assigned to Berkeley. Um, but it was clear a lot of Berkeley news was going uncovered. Um, and in 2009, with my wife, who who also had a long career in journalism and another friend, um, we started Berkeley side, partly because it seemed like a might be a fun thing to do on the side, but also we recognized there was a really big gap in terms of stuff that wasn't being covered. Yeah, it's amazing because like when you think of news deserts, you think of these like super rural areas that supposedly can't support like a local newspaper anymore. But I'm always surprised by kind of like you hear about these like rich, densely populated suburbs that didn't really have like a dedicated newspaper. Like another you know famous example is Arlington, Virginia, which is outside of D.C., super affluent um, uh, I would call it a city, although I don't know if it technically qualifies as a city, um, but there's certainly large buildings there, larger than any buildings in D.C., um, suit like all the affluent people who, you know, people who make in the six figures who, who work in D.C. Live in, live in Arlington, and yet uh, up until there was no, like, dedicated Arlington newspaper, and, and now there's, like, a de- there's, there's this uh, – website called all into now that was started up like 10 years ago but i was just surprised i'm surprised like a place like berkeley which is well known it has a university um i'm sure it has a thriving business district i'm sure a ton of people affluent people in tech work there and yet it's kind of do, isn't it kind of surprising that it doesn't have or didn't have like a legacy newspaper attached to it um I think many of these you know, smaller cities at one time had their own newspaper. Berkeley certainly did. Um, I, I didn't know about Arlington, um, but I think in the heyday of the Metro papers, um, these cities were covered pretty well by the Metro paper. I don't know when the Chronicle last had a dedicated Berkeley correspondent, but I suspect they did have at some point. Um, and as the newsrooms of those metro papers shrank, um, the resources they dedicated to anything, but certainly outlying cities um, shrank as well. I mean, one of my co-founders on Berkeley side, Francis Dinklesfield, she had worked on the San Jose Mercury News. Um, and I think at one point in the 90s, the Merc had 240 people in the newsroom. Um, it now has maybe 40. Um, and, you know, when they had 240 people, you know, the Merck had, you know, they their patch didn't extend up to Berkeley, but there were certainly lots of places around San Jose, which the Merck had dedicated reporters in. And I'm sure the Chronicle was the same. As I said, in, in 2009, the Oakland Tribune, was just hanging on. I mean, the the guy who was reporting in Berkeley, he made it very clear that his job was on the chopping block and he did not expect to be here for long. And, and certainly, I don't know if it was in 2009, but at some point in 2010, his, you know, he lost that beat and they had nobody here. So um, I think that's a kind of common path for many of the once powerful Metro papers. So you, as you mentioned, you launched with your wife and another co-founder this blog. It was it was really just like a blog back then. It was like re- reverse chronological blog post, right? Yeah. It, it, when, when we talked earlier, I said I I kind of shudder when people make just a blog comments. I think blogging was an incredibly important thing um, for conveying information for the change in our ecosystem. Um, But yes, it was a blog when we started. Um, It was reverse chronological. We wrote about all sorts of quirky things. We did some reporting as well. Um, But, you know, in our evolution, it, you know, we eventually moved to more of a a sort of front page and articles structure. Um, And so it became unblog like so yeah, like you, so it wasn't really super disciplined. Like it's not like you were at every single city council meeting or um, or school board meeting or anything like that. But you were kind of just kind of covering whatever 
inter- it, whatever interested you and in what what you had time to write about, I'm guessing. Yeah, certainly when we launched in October 2009, yeah, we were not thorough by any stretch of the imagination, but we got there pretty rapidly. And were you doing original reporting? Were you, ca- were you calling up s- sources or was it more kind of just like what you saw happening in your community you were writing about and, and kind of basing it on other local reporting or stuff like that? It was a mixture. Um, we certainly did. I saw something interesting and I'm going to react to it. Um, sorts of posts, um, but Francis, who had a you know deep um, experience in you know local reporting, um, you know she was doing some real reported stories almost from the start. So it, it was a mixture. And what was kind of the initial reaction from the community? Well, that was the remarkable thing, and I'm sure other people, you know, you mentioned Arlington now. I'm sure when Scott Broadbeck started that. I suspect he had similar, even though we were doing really modest things, the reaction from, from the community was extraordinary. Um, people stopping us in the streets and saying, I never knew that, or it's so great you're doing this, or, uh, you know, you know, I wonder if you could cover this. Um, it, it, it really was the depth and extent of the reaction from people we didn't know or hardly knew that convinced us there was something more here than just, oh, this will be a fun little side project. And then how did it transition from this little side project to something that you wanted to make sustainable? From, wh- from what I remember is you, you got a phone call out of the blue. Yeah, mysterious phone call. Um, yeah, totally out of the blue, um, a local resident phoned us and said, hey, I'm reading Berkeley side, I really like what you guys are doing. Do you need any money? Um, and once we'd established his bona fides, um, you know, we entered into a discussion with him. Um, he was someone who had made, you know, a significant amount of money um, in a hedge fund in the Bay Area. And essentially, he was investing in things he liked, um, you know, had invested in a local tequila company there's a movie theater here that you know at one point he invested in just things he wanted to invest in the community and he thought we would be a a good target for that we he offered us a hundred thousand dollars um we foolishly turned him down and said we'll only take 50. um but with that fifty thousand um we were able to hire a salesperson and that was really the first step in helping us become more of a business and something that could be sustained. And he was actually taking like an equity stake, right? Yeah, 20%, um, which as you can probably guess was never worth much, but uh, yeah, he, he for his $50,000, he got 20% of Berkeley side LLC as it was then. And for, so for this initial iteration, and we'll talk further down about how this changed, but the initial iteration was this was a for-profit news site. Absolutely. Uh, it was a for-profit news site for about 10 years without much in the way of profits, but I know we'll get to that. Um, so you ha- you hire a salesperson, and I'm guessing this is for what, ad sales? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And what did that do for you? Like how quickly did that ramp up and and what did that do in terms of allowing you to expand what you were doing? I wouldn't say it was quick to ramp up, but it did begin to produce a stream of revenue um that you know, in addition to that $50,000 infusion of capital, it covered Wendy, who was the salesperson, it covered her costs and and a bit more. Um, it began to, you know, provide some more money to invest in Berkeley side. We also at about the same time started a membership program, um, and that also began to ramp up quite nicely. Um, but I think looking back, um, we remained the three founders, all of us who had, you know, other other things to do for certainly the initial years that paid the bills. Um, 
And but we did began to do more reporting. We began to hire freelancers to do some reporting. Um, so it definitely, you know, the difference if I look back between October 2009 when we found it to even you know, end of 2010, a year on, it, it really was quite dramatic. And as you're hiring some freelancers and you're like justifying making this more and more part of your, you know, daily mix of work, what what was the kind of priority of the coverage? Like, what did you decide you were going to focus on with very limited resources? Um, we picked some of the obvious things. Um, we started going to every city council meeting, uh, started going to, I don't think we initially we went to every school board meetings, but when there were important issues, we went to school board meetings. Um, we were very good from early on in covering uh, development land use issues, um, you know, new construction projects, um, you know, Berkeley back, you know, 2010, 2011 still uh, had a reputation as being a, a NIMBY hotbed. Um, and so these things were were big stories, um, and I think we did a very good job of covering development. Um, you know, we have this large, very famous research university in the middle of the city. Um, we took a decision pretty early on that most things involving the university weren't our story. Um, it was only when university action spilled over into affecting the wider city that we thought that was our story. Um, but, and we, you know, we began to cover some of the key important things in the city for sure. And the pit was the membership pitch, like just basically support local journalism. Like what I'm guessing there was no paywall or anything like that. We, we have never had a paywall. We will never have a paywall. Um, all our content is, and always will be free. Um, that's a deep, deep part of our philosophy. Um, you know, if any of your listeners are familiar with the geography of um, Berkeley and the Bay Area generally, um, Berkeley extends from the San Francisco Bay up into the hills. And loosely, the further you get up into the hills, the richer people are. And we, we, we really felt that some of our reporting was more important to people who might be housing insecure than to a rich person in the hills. And we wanted the you know person who was maybe living in you know their car to be have access to that reporting just as easily as somebody in a big house in the hills. So how did you make the transition from like a salesperson and then a bunch of part-time people kind of cobbling together coverage to you know, a, a little bit more traditional newsroom structure where you were able to have some full-time people, have an editor, and really kind of formally build out beats and stuff like that? Um, growing ad revenues, growing uh, reader revenue together enabled us in 2013 to hire a full-time reporter. Um, and at about that same time, Tracy Taylor, um, one of my co-founders and my, and my wife, um, she went full time um, on Berkeley side. Um, you know, gave, gave up her other work um, to devote herself to editing it full time. Um, so that's when it began to look more like, I guess, a, a traditional newsroom would. Those still, you know, very very. Small. Yeah, and so you're you're kind of slowly growing. You you eventually launched some kind of public offering, which I didn't even know existed outside of the IPO, the traditional IPO. When did that happen, and like, what was the decision process for that? Like, what what was the goal with that? So we thought things were going pretty well, but we were operating on an absolute shoestring. Um, but we knew from the community that there was a a real thirst for more coverage. That there was a lot more we can do. Um, in a very Bay Area kind of way, we talked to, um, you know, potential angel investor types, you know, would they, you know, invest in, in Berkeley side? And, you know, we had perfectly pleasant conversations with people, but honestly, there was no one who wanted to write an enormous check because it's not a good business. You know, it's it's. It's a business that can kind of sustain itself, but no one was going to make a return 
on investing in in her work. Um, and just you know, just like that phone call into in two thousand early two thousand ten, um, one of our readers and a member emailed me and said, "Hey, I really like what you guys do." Um, I think you'd be a great candidate for this thing called a direct public offering. Um, is that something you, I don't know if you need any money, but is that something you've ever considered? And I got in touch with him and it turns out that the, you know, although most investments offered to the public, like an IPO, have incredibly high standards of disclosure and years of audited uh, accounts and you need an investment bank and all sorts of things. There was this part of the law which enabled you, provided you got over some pretty low hurdles to offer um, shares directly to the public. It's called a direct public offering. Um, the one, the, the two direct public offerings that people are usually familiar with is the Green Bay Packers uh, did a direct public offering. That's why the community of people in Green Bay own the Packers. And at one point, Ben and Jerry's, the ice cream people before they sold to whoever it was, um, they did a, a direct public offering. Um, but we in 2016, said to our readers, um, invest in Berkeley side. Um, we're trying to raise a million dollars. And over the next year and a half, we, we needed to get authority from uh, one of the agencies of the state of California. We, did, we couldn't just do this on our own. So we, we went through a, a proper scrutiny process and that enabled us to offer what were preferred shares in Berkeley side Inc at this point. Um, and we raised a bit over a million dollars from about 350 people. Um, we were incredibly honest to them. We said, if you look at this as a financial investment, it will be the worst investment of your life. Um, but if you look at it as a community investment, an impact investment, um, we think it, it can be an important investment. And uh, 350 people put up you know, be among them between a thousand dollars, the largest single investment we had was a hundred thousand dollars. And like, was there some exchange where people could buy and sell these shares in the future, or like, what was how did how does it differ from an IPO? Like you said that you don't have to have as many public disclosures and stuff like that. Like, I'm I'm guessing you didn't have to have quarterly earnings calls and stuff like that. No, um, we didn't. Um, I have to look back at the paperwork. I, I think people, you know, you could, you were free to provided um, we agreed, you know, you could sell your shares to someone else. There was no exchange, but people could make private arrangements, um, you know, to avoid the unlikely prospect of Rupert Murdoch buying up all the shares. You know, we had to approve um, of any sales, but there were never any sales that happened. So, so that was not really an important clause. So what did that million dollars do for you? What, like, how did that change the organization? Well, we were able to hire um, another full-time reporter. Um, Francis and I were able to pretty much shed our other side gigs. Um, we totally redesigned the site so that it could be mobile first. Um, we invested pretty heavily in our member program. Um, it really supercharged that. And um, so we put it on a much more secure footing. So in terms of memberships, what like what is your strategy there? Like, uh, obviously, there's lots of different ways uh, to go about it. I just um, talked to, uh, I just got finished doing a podcast interview with someone else who that created like a registration wall where you never actually needed to pay, but the registration wall hit you after three times and you had to create an account. And that's when it would kind of nudge you towards becoming a donor. What was your strategy? Uh, and then I talked to other people who do like more like a public radio model where they just like to like twice a year or something like that. They really hit hard with donation messages. What have you seen that's been really effective? Um, we're more the, you know, in, in that, 
comparison, we're more of the public radio model. We also, since, I have to look back, maybe since 2015, we've worked with the News Revenue Hub, which it, you may have encountered them. They, they really have been, I think, a pioneer in helping news organizations develop reader revenue strategies. Um, but yeah, we have two, often three campaigns, a sort of spring, summer, and end of year campaign. Um, we have calls to action on the site um, and in our newsletters. We do monthly what we call timely topicals, where you know we pick something that uh, has happened or that we've reported on, where we encourage people to become members. We're we're pretty aggressive about it, and as we've learned more and more, we've become more aggressive about it. Um, you know, like many journalists, early on we thought, oh, we can't possibly send in other email people will take offense or they'll unsubscribe or whatever um uh, that has not proven to be true so we ask people often you know if you like our reporting support it and early on i have to say a very good sort of object lesson in this is i think in either 2013 or 2014 um there were some really significant black lives matter protests in Berkeley, um, and there were violent clashes between protesters and the police. Um, our reporter at the time, Emily, was all over it. She was covering it, you know, round the clock. And this occurred over a weekend. And I remember Monday morning, we sent out an email to our, you know, email list that had a first line of something like, you know, um, our reporter, Emily Reguso, was covering this weekend's protests, you know, from 8 a.m. on Saturday morning through to, you know, three in the morning without a bathroom break. Um, and that was, at the time, overwhelmingly the most successful, you know, membership solicitation we've ever had. And it, it really kind of convinced us that you know, people don't become members to get a tote bag or, you know, some bonus or whatever. They become members because they were affected by your reporting. And if you can capitalize on that, if you can hit them when they're feeling that the impact of your reporting, it can be very, very effective. Hey, I just want to interrupt the programming for just a moment to note that you are at the halfway point of the video. If you made it this far, then that's probably a sign that you like this sort of content. So maybe just take a second to subscribe to the channel below. If you're feeling especially generous, you can hit the like button. Okay, back to the show. Yeah, and that's what I've learned from other talking to other local news publishers is like in your messaging, don't just do a generic, you know, support your local news source. Talk about impact. We, you know, we, you know, prior to us, there was not a regular reporter in your city council meetings. Now there's a reporter there reporting for you every time we we exposed, you know, this local factory of pouring waste into rivers like stuff like that to like really kind of uh you, you know connect a to b in terms of you donate and this is what the the outcome is and that's like in, hugely important especially for kind of mission oriented news orgs absolutely um and you know we we survey our members fairly regularly um and what they consistently tell us is spend our money on your reporting don't give us anything. I had I was at a conference this weekend and somebody asked me, um, you know, what do you give your members? And I said, we give them a warm feeling in their hearts. Um, and it really is remarkably consistent that people say, I don't want anything other than more reporting. And on the advertising sales side, you know, you think about traditional media, you know, Craigslist, you know, really played a part in terms of decimating the lucrative classified ads. And then over the last like 10 years or so, like obviously platforms like Google and Facebook have really honed their local advertising, you know, and have vacuumed up a lot of that revenue. What did you see that worked that was effective in terms of attracting 
ad dollars from local businesses? Like what was the the kind of value proposition of your publication versus, you know, using like a self-service system like Facebook or something like that? Well, early on, I think it was very effective to say you're local and we're local. Um, and I think local businesses appreciated that and and wanted to support that, not entirely altruistically. You know, we had readers, we had loyalty um, from people, um, but they thought that resonates. Um, and, you know, I'll believe that, you know, if somebody sees my ad in the local news, um, news site compared to, I mean, in the early teens, I, I don't think many people were thinking about Oh, I'll do Facebook ads. That was still pretty novel then. But um, you know, I think they said, yes, we want to support local. We are local, and that that works. I mean, as our readership has grown, um, of course, there are people who um, you know put some of their marketing spend with Facebook or Google um, or Amazon. Um, but you know, we have a mix some very, very small merchants who, you know, the $500 they may spend in a month, we may get the bulk of it, but we also have some very sophisticated advertisers who continue to advertise with us because it's, you know, it's proving effective for them. Um, we also increasingly, and I know we'll get to this, you know, we've, you know, as we moved away from being a for-profit, um, you know, more and more of our, dollars are you know sponsorship dollars um which some of that is pure yes we support your mission and we want to support that but you know a lot of it is tied to events we hold or or um you know other activities that are kind of special and it's not a traditional you know cost per thousand kind of relationship yeah, so you mentioned the the transfer from not for profit to nonprofit. <laughs> so you you're you had an initial angel investor, then you also had a public offering. So you have all these stakeholders who have this equity. And yeah, you were you were transparent that you're not you're not going to become a billionaire by being able to sell your shares. But at the same time, they owned actual equity in this. Well, first, like, what was the decision of because you had gone down so far down this route of for profit? Why did you first decide to then transfer into becoming a nonprofit? Um, I think there were a number of different factors. One was there really weren't any profits. I mean, we could have, you know, cut some of our staff and probably shown some profits, but that would have incredibly compromised what we were doing as an organization. Um, so there weren't profits or there were very, very few profits. Second, we acutely felt um, the opportunity to do more, not just in Berkeley, but next door, we had a much larger city, Oakland, um, where the Oakland Tribune had ceased to exist in, I think, either 2016 or 2017. Um, it was owned by, you know, ultimately, Alden Capital. Um, many of your listeners will be familiar with what a terrible newspaper owner that is. Um, they had merged the Oakland Tribune and the Contra Costa Times into a thing called the East Bay Times. Um, Oakland is a city of 440,000 people, and they had two reporters covering Oakland. Um, you know, there's some really talented people there, but they were devoting essentially, you know, negligible resources to covering a fairly significant city. Um, so we thought there was a great opportunity there. Um, looking around, there were other places in the Bay Area that lacked local news. We wanted to do more, and we felt that on our current trajectory, it was unlikely we'd ever have the resources to do that. Um, nonprofit news had been a growing um, field. In 2009, when we started, um, it was still an active question whether the IRS would except certainly local news as um, a legitimate nonprofit pursuit. You know, ProPublica existed at that point. Texas Tribune had just been created where, where we almost share the same birthday. Um, but, you know, there was a question mark as to whether 
local news reporting would be judged by the IRS to be a, um, you know, a community benefit, a charitable pursuit. Um, but it was well established by 2018 when we began thinking about this. Um, we decided it was the way to go. Um, it meant giving up control, um, which, you know, all of us have egos. Um, we had long ceased to think we will make money by, you know, one day selling our ownership of Berkeley side. Um, so it wasn't about we're giving up a possible, you know, bonanza at the end. But, you know, for 10 years, every decision about what we were doing had been made by three of us. Um, and going nonprofit, you can't do that. You have to have a, a board that is independent. Um, some decisions would be out of our hands, but we thought in terms of what we wanted to do, being more ambitious, um, nonprofit was the way to go. And, you know, spoiler alert, because we'll talk about what happened, you know, it was, you know, together with starting 14 years ago, it was the best decision we ever made. So just to understand the decision making process here is that with not with the nonprofit status, it wouldn't stop you from doing anything that you were currently doing, but it could only enhance it because a suddenly a lot of these don the, these people who are basically donating to be in the membership program anyway, they could write it off as a tax write off, which they weren't able to do before. So that provided a little bit more incentive, but then it also opened up a whole new avenue of like grants and stuff like that. Correct. Like that was, yeah, that was part of it. That, that, that's precisely it. We could do everything we were doing already. Um, and we could add possibly pursuing foundation money grants and getting wealthy people, major donors to, to support us as well. Um, so it added two significant new buckets of revenue to what we've been doing before. And so you, you have this sticky situation of all these shareholders. What I'm assuming they needed to approve of this. Yeah, California, and I suspect most states are similar in this regard, to convert your company from for-profit to non-profit, you need unanimous consent of the shareholders. And I had 350 shareholders. Um, so it was a sort of year long effort to convince them that the investment they had made just a few years before um, was going to be valued at zero um, and that the right thing for us was to convert to nonprofit. The majority of them instantly got it. Many of them said to me something like, you know, I always saw it as in effect, you know, a nonprofit donation. I knew I was never going to make money out of it. So I thought you should have done this years ago. Um, a bunch of people needed pursuit, not because they didn't like the idea, but just because they didn't respond to you know, the first two emails and I needed them. You, you couldn't just say, oh, I tried to reach this person. They didn't object. I needed their signature on a piece of paper saying I accept that, you know, this is being converted to nonprofit. So there was a lot of chasing needed. There was a tiny group of people who either because they were pissed off that we changed our strategy or in one case, because they just were opposed to nonprofit organizations, they thought they were a bad idea, um, who said, no, I won't consent. And so we had to buy their shares back. Um, uh, but, you know, over the course of, you know, from mid-2018 to mid-2019, we, we got to 100%. Yeah, and I'm guessing... You know, there were probably sticky situations where there was a divorce or someone died and their heirs got their shares. And so there's maybe people living in a completely different city who don't even know what you did. I mean, did you have like uh, individual cases like that? Yeah, there were three or four of the 350 who it just it was incredibly difficult to track down. You know, they, the email address we had was non-responsive. The physical address we had was no longer their address. 
Um, so I think I think there were in the end there were three where um, there is money in escrow. I think I think good thing you reminded me. I think I can go back to the escrow holder because it was something like you have to keep it in escrow for two years or three years, and that time has passed. In case somebody said, "Hey, whatever happened to our shares in X?" There was is money sitting in an escrow account for them. But um, I think that time has now passed. Interesting. Okay, so you you successfully converted to a nonprofit. Yeah. You you're talking about wanting to launch a I'm guessing a sister publication in Oakland. You also and I, I don't know the timeline for all this. You came into some money through Facebook and Google. What was kind of like what happened after the nonprofit uh, status in terms of the expansion, launching the sister site, and coming into this massive amount of money from these large tech platforms? So in 2019, when we were, you know, in the process of this conversion, um, we were able to get two um, real cornerstone investments in our work. One was from the Google News Initiative, um, uh, and which was for $1.56 million um, to help us launch Oakland Side. Um, the other was from the American Journalism Project, HAP, um, for exactly the same amount of money, $1.56 million, um, which was also tied to our expansion. But um, as you may be familiar with the AJP's sort of philosophy, what they call um, venture philanthropy was is very much designed to help news organizations become sustainable um, businesses by investing in their sort of business and operational roles. So um, those two cornerstone funders were crucial for us. And you used all that money to just launch Oakland side? Absolutely. Um, we used it to launch Oakland side and we used it also to hire, um, you know, people on the business, you know, the AJP money is in, in nonprofit parlance is restricted funds. And the restriction was these are funds to hire people on the business side of your operation. So another salesperson, an audience person, uh, someone to start our uh, fundraising development operations and so on. And in terms of launching a brand new site, obviously you have an already existing audience. You actually have funding this time around. It's not the same as it's a completely different era of the Internet. Uh, so it was probably completely different than launching Berkeley side. What were you, was it basically almost like basically taking all your operations on the Berkeley side and just copying them over to Oakland side? Did you centralize operations? Like how, how have you become more efficient at being a media organization now that you've already done this one time? Um, so our theory of the case is that um, what works, the local, you know, one of the intrinsic problems with local news is journalists don't scale. Um, and that's okay. I don't want journalists to scale. Um, but what can scale are the business and operation side. So we have a sort of hub and spoke model. The hub, which is city side or our parent organization, the nonprofit, the 5013 C organization um, has all of the resources, expertise, knowledge that sustains their business. So uh, management, financial controls, um, fundraising, membership, product, audience, sponsorship and advertising, uh, event organization, all of that is at the city side level. At the local level with a newsroom in Oakland, with a newsroom in Berkeley and soon a newsroom in Richmond, um, that the journalists are completely focused on their city, on that coverage. And so, yes, there were lessons we had learned in developing Berkeley side that we were able to apply. But I think importantly, we we recognized, even though Oakland is next door, it's a very different city. It isn't just that it's bigger. It has a different history. It has a different makeup. It has a different culture. It is a different 
sense of who it is. And we we went in very, very humbly to Oakland. We did not say, hey, we know all about what Oakland is going to need because we've been next door for 10 years. We went in and said, we need to talk to Oaklanders. Tell us what you want in terms of information. What are the stories that you're interested in that aren't being told? And so we did a sort of four to six month process of really intense community listening as preparation for the launch of Oaklandside. The other thing we did, which is fundamental, is we found and we recruited Tasneem Raja, um, who is an extraordinary innovator um, in our world, to come and join us as a co-founder of Cityside and to to launch Oaklandside. And Tasneem, you know, remains you know, one of our co-founders, and she still is running Oakland side. And, you know, so if you look at Oakland side and Berkeley side today, you'll see some shared DNA. Um, You know, they're not totally different, but they are different and they should be different because they're different cities. And, you know, we're soon going to go to Richmond and that will be different again. So, you know, I think that's necessary to do truly local, truly community-based journalism. And uh, when did you launch Oakland Side? We Oakland Side launched in June of 2020, um, which was in the depths of the pandemic. Um, in terms of building audience, that was a great thing because, of course, people were thirsting for local coverage, um, wanted to know everything. And so it, it really supercharged our ability to gain audience pretty rapidly. It made launching it incredibly difficult. I think the team, and we started with 10 people on Oakland side, um, it wasn't until maybe mid-August that all of them got together. We met in a park in Oakland, you know, outdoors and distance. Um, So it was really launched virtually with people who had mostly never worked together through Zoom and and through that. So that was complicated, but um, it, you know, it, it worked pretty well. And do you have a sense of how long it took before Oakland Side was kind of, like obviously it had all this startup funding, but that it was contributing enough revenue to like be sustainable through like advertising and memberships and stuff like that? Um, yeah, I'd say roughly two years. It's sometimes hard to disaggregate because, um, Particularly, the larger checks and grants we get are typically people say, I'm, I'm giving this grant to Cityside. They're, they're not saying, I want this to support Oakland or I want this to support Berkeley. Um, so some of that is hard to unpack. But um, so we launched in June 2020. We had set a goal of by the end of 2020 having a thousand members for Oakland And I remember telling Tasneem, I think that's a great goal. I think it's absolutely crazy, but I think it's a great goal. We had a thousand members by September of 2020 and by the end of 2020, we had 1400 members. We now have nearly 3000 members on Oakland side. So between Oakland and Berkeley, this year we'll make about a million dollars from our members. Um, These are small dollar donors, um, nearly 8,000 between the two cities. Um, so the growth in membership has been fantastic. Um, the growth in advertising at Oakland side was slower initially. The pandemic made that hard. Obviously things like entertainment venues just weren't operating and that's been a great category for us traditionally. Um, but also for Colleen and, you know, uh, the, the people sort of selling advertising, there was essentially a year when she couldn't go out and meet people, which is a big part of that work. Um, So that was slower, um, but that has grown well, um, as has sponsorship, you know, from larger companies, which Oakland much more than Berkeley attracts that kind of interest. Um, So it's gone pretty well. And foundations and foundations are very interested in Oakland um, and foundations don't care about Berkeley and they're right not to care about Berkeley. Berkeley is doing fine, um, whereas Oakland 
as you know some really graphic historical inequities still um and so it's an object of of foundation interest and how big is your staff now across all the organizations so I, we're now 28 people i'm hoping this week to make an offer to somebody so we'll be at 29 um and in at the beginning of 2020 um you know we were seven people so it's been pretty dramatic growth and how many people are in editorial? Um, of those 28, uh, 20 are in editorial, I think, if I count correctly. And do you produce any other kind of content other than written content? Do you do live events, podcasts, video, or anything like that? Are any of those things priorities for you? We've had a few dribbles of podcasts. I, I wouldn't pretend that's been much for us, but events are very, very important to us. Um, one of the hires we made earlier this year was a director of events. Um, we have both Oakland side and Berkeley side have a regular quarterly event on Oakland side. It's called Oakland side culture makers on Berkeley side. It's Berkeley side idea makers. These are one evening events. Um, and they're they're proving very very popular in terms of you know people buying tickets to go to them um but also they're they're pretty good for sponsorship um and we're talking now that we have becky running our events uh, we're talking about a few more ambitious events as well and when you kind of i mean we're seeing something happen especially within the last few years of this kind of local news resurgence we're seeing a ton of new startups, you know, you know, you look at the major associations like Lion and stuff, they're, they're um, reporting record uh, membership. A lot of them are starting out as kind of like just like one person newsletters that are kind of expanding from there. Um, you know, as someone who is kind of led the forefront of this kind of uh, change within the industry of these kind of like more lean um uh, digital only operations that aren't tied to any kind of legacy, legacy news organization. What is some of the advice you would give to someone who's maybe starting out at a small city in like Tennessee or something like that? Uh, like, would it be, would you, if you were launching today, would you be a blog or would you be a newsletter first? Like I notice a lot are kind of their, their minimum viable products are newsletters because that's the easiest way to own your audience and also just get something off the ground. And then also, also there's the question of nonprofit versus for-profit. So like what kind of advice would you give to someone who is just, who's maybe laid off from their, you know, Gannett owned or Alden owned newspaper and thinking about launching their own thing? Um, you're right. There's a lot happening there. You know, I, we were a founding member of Lion when um so it's it's a great organization we're obviously very involved in the institute for nonprofit news as well um i'm incredibly optimistic both because of what so many people are showing can be done um but also because of what i anticipate will be a lot of new entrants going forward um i think my advice would be a few things one is just get it going um Analysis paralysis is a terrible thing. Um, you just need to start doing stuff. Um, second, um, the journalism is the easy part. Of course, journalism, it, good journalism is not easy, but in the context of building a sustainable business, there are lots of people who've shown they can do really good journalism. There are many, many fewer people who've shown I can marry to that something that's actually going to sustain this. Um, so I think right from the start, you have to be aware of, I need to have either personally the ability to bring in revenue, whether it's reader revenue, whether it's advertising, whether it's uh, donations, whether it's grants, um, or I need to pair up with someone who has that ability. Um, in terms of formats, I'm very, very pro newsletters. They're important to us. Um, you know, Oakland Side, before we did that June 2020 launch, we actually had an Oakland Side newsletter that was just kind of beginning to get the reporting out and, and beginning to build um, our audience. So I suspect newsletters will be important for almost anyone. The issue with newsletters is discoverability is hard. 
Um, I know, you know, if people launch on Substack or something like that, there's some built-in tools that help to some extent. But if you are purely a newsletter, um, Google doesn't see you. Um, and, you know, you need to figure out what's going to enable people to discover my work. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm sure people have done it the other way. I would think it, even if your newsletter forward, you probably need to have some web presence in the back of that so that you can have a search strategy. Um, because at least for the moment, you know, generative AI may change this, but search is the way people will find you. Yeah. And, and certainly like a lot of newsletter platforms like Substack are more kind of web friendly these days yeah. where they, they like you visit a Substack newsletter, it looks just like a blog or, or a news website. It doesn't it, it's not that it screams out to you. I'm looking at a newsletter versus you, if you land on like a MailChimp newsletter, you're like, oh, this is not meant to be consumed on the web. This is this is, you know, definitely something that's more optimized. Um, yeah. for an inbox. So I, I see people kind of creating like hybrid newsletter article pages and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. You just, you need, you know, you need to have some kind of revenue strategy. I am, I think in most places, not the nonprofit model is going to be the winning model just because of the variety of revenue streams you can have. And because it is less dependent on audience. I mean, you need an audience, you know, you know, that's what gives you impact, but, um, you know, impact isn't an exact correlation with audience. And, you know, as I suspect will happen, you know, search becomes less powerful, um, in terms of generating traffic. Um, I think that's going to create new problems for the for profit. Okay. Lance, well, those are all the questions I have for you. Where can people find you online? You can go to citysidejournalism.org for the organization, but the best way is look at oaklandside.org or berkeleyside.org. Awesome. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks so much, Simon.